Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Anissa Avon and welcome to Leading in a Crisis Virtual Summit, Actionable Business and HR Strategies for Navigating Crisis and Change. And I've been very much looking forward to our talk today, uh, Creating a Safe Place to Talk at Work, Black Lives Matter. And um, I'm so grateful, Candace, that you've joined us today. Um, expert coach, trainer, and uh, VP of Talent Strategy. Thank you, Candace. Hey, her. thanks for having me. Really excited to be here. Me too. Me too. So we're going to um, just jump on in. I want to say very quickly thank you to our sponsors, uh, the Whitmarsh Consulting Group, without David Whitmarsh and his team, our entire summit would not be possible. Um, David and his team are pretty talented marketing and uh, multi-channel marketing and social media strategy and white papers and research papers and, and uh, even retargeting campaigns. So if your organization would benefit from a super marketing expert, I highly encourage you to contact David and his team. And at the end of our talk today, we're going to talk a little bit about how organizations are addressing racism and biases and microaggressions and just holding the space for a dialogue. So I wanted to mention that right up front, um, that one of the offerings that Candace and myself and some other members of our team have put together in response to our crisis that our country and, and at this point world are sharing with us today is about addressing systemic racism. And, and the series is called Systemic Racism Series, Anti-Racism Facilitated Dialogue. And the intention is about holding a safe space for non-experts to talk about racism and marginalization and um, biases in the workplace. So uh, reach out if you are looking for a solution. I'd love to have that dialogue with you and to support you and your team in that way. So Candace McGlynn, VP of Talent Strategy, um, Learning Solutions Consultant, um, Candace is also an author of Engage Us Now. And one of the things that I've really enjoyed about getting to know Candace is just her fearless and yet I would call it a, an, um, the word that comes to mind is equanimity. She has a really calm and solid and confident approach to all of the things that she's brought to bear inside our leading in a crisis, which in fact is in the sign of a leader to me, a sign of leadership is that space of quiet confidence, <laughs> quiet calm in the middle of a storm. So Candace, I'm gonna stop showing my screen. I'd, I'd love for you to share with us who you are and what we're gonna learn today and, and go from there. Absolutely. Thank you for your kind words. That was nice. I'll have to get that snippet of the recording <laughs> and share that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm Candace McGlenn again. I started my career actually in grassroots organizing and, you know, focusing on environmental issues and social justice issues and really quickly learned that human resources was a great place to be if I wanted to see change through people, right? People power, helping people grow, develop, uh, and learn. So it's, it's a great time to be here um, and, and having these conversations and leading the Crisis Summit because I do think that HR and learning and development leaders and, and the folks that will be attending this, this webinar are in a unique space to bring about change in their organizations. Um, I agree. So, we will talk about um, what it means to... I'm going to let you show your screen. Let yeah. me make sure you've got permission. It looks like you do. Can you, do you see the share screen button? I do, yep. Okay, awesome. Thank and that, thank yeah. you guys for joining us. If you have questions, we would love for you to submit those. Um, I'll be monitoring the chat box. And otherwise, I'm going to... Um, Candice and I are just going to have a candid conversation and and be open and, and free with, with our dialogue as people do in the workplace. So that's the intention. Absolutely. And, and like you said, there, there's been a lot that has happened over the last few weeks. And I think even leading back to, you know, the start of the COVID-19 um, pandemic and, and just how that has really opened our eyes in a lot of ways to the things that are happening and, and things that can be improved upon. And so, 
current conversations around race and inequality are, are definitely necessary in, in moving forward. And we have this concept of, of developing a safe space and a safe space to talk. But I do want to debunk the myth of what a safe space means. It's, it's safe space does not necessarily mean comfort, right? Because these are very uncomfortable conversations. It doesn't matter where you are in, in your journey or who you are, or how you show up. They're very uncomfortable conversations to have. So I want to just say that it's important that we know that where we are is <laughs> in the land of getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I love this quote um, by Shailene Johnson that just says, um, that's how you break the plateau and reach the next level. And I think that's where we're going. It's, it's really a focus on experiences and elevating human experiences. As organizations, we focus a lot on the customer experience and how our and mapping that customer experience from start to finish with working with us. Um, but that, that's equally as important with our employees and understanding what their individual experiences are, their group level experiences are in our organization and, and broader. And so that's what the, the safe space conversation is about and, and having those conversations around race. You know, and you will probably get to this. So tell me to pause on my questions and you're gonna cool. get to this, but there is a pretty serious resistance to discomfort. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and from my perspective, in, in many Americans, um, there is a, an emotional intelligence that um, has not necessarily been cultivated specifically around this conversation. Yeah. Um, and I, I am wondering, so here's my question, I'm wondering how does someone support their team in getting comfortable being uncomfortable? Yeah. I would say, so I, um, I'll go to this next one. The first one is, I look at this conversation, there's two approaches that you could have. Um, it's either going to be a fear-based approach to having the conversation, or you can operate in, in love. And I, I know love is like this, this weird term that we don't hear in, in corporations but the reason why I, I think it's important is because while it is an uncomfortable conversation and while there are things that are uncomfortable, I think that when we come from the perspective that this is an issue that all of us are affected by on some level, whether directly or indirectly, and we want to help with resolving it or we want to contribute, whether it's or determining ways that we could, you know, take action externally. Um, it's important to look at look at it from a place of love, and, you know, as HR professionals, and I've sat in that seat in HR where we we get really uncomfortable with these conversations because we're thinking about compliance and we're thinking about, you know, I don't know what the risk is around opening up the dialogue about these conversations and, and experience. And, you know, when you operate from a place of love, it's taking a stance on what the organization represents and what the organization stands for. And that while it's not going to be a perfect experience, a perfect journey, there are going to be mistakes that are made. Um, when you keep that intention and that why on we're doing this with an end goal in mind to get to a better reality for everyone. Um, I think those mistakes, that level of transparency, that level of vulnerability is more accepted. Um, but when you do things from a place of, you know, compliance or don't want to stir up the pot a bit, it shows and that message is more clearer than I think a lot of us know or believe the um, compliance approach is going to be an impetus in some organizations. And the challenge with that is, is the level of love versus fear is what I'm hearing you say. And if that dialogue comes from a place of, we have to check the box, we have to look like we're doing the conversation, um, then in all likelihood, it's, it's not going to produce the results that are needed. Yeah. And it could even 
correct me if I'm wrong, but in my mind, it, this is not a time to, to do something inauthentically. This is not yeah, a yeah. time to kick a hornet's nest and, and then go, oh, I hope that doesn't stir up the pot. Right. That's a Absolutely. poor analogy for a variety of reasons. <laughs> right. But. You yeah. gave me a flashback of the. But yeah. yeah. So, so <laughs> this is the kind of thing that I mean, though, that the dialogue yeah. is uncomfortable. Um, and one of the reasons you and I wanted to have this conversation is because it is not just about bringing experts to bear on this okay. conversation. Yeah. This is about everyday average employees, average individuals who don't have to be expert, who are going to have to find a way to have the dialogue. Yes. Yeah. The dialogue is the only way. And I think, um, you know, when we're talking about a safe place and space to talk, it is not that it's not going to be messy. It's, it's going to be messy. Um, but I think having that authentic, transparent and vulnerable approach to having those conversations and and we'll get into kind of what that looks like but having that as and with an end goal in mind a collective end goal in mind Good. i think that gives grace right and in, in between the space of the process because it's a journey you never actually reach a destination right it's a continued journey um, on getting to where you're trying to go it's a continuous actionable step right we never fully arrive there's always something to learn there's always more to learn um so that authenticity is key we cannot stand um behind the compliance piece and just checking the box anymore we have to rip the band-aid off right and and be okay with that process but doing it in a way that makes everyone feel comfortable um in terms of you know, we, we're having this conversation, there's an end goal, there's a destination sort of thing. I have a, a question about that, you know, why, why, why can't we just stand behind compliance? But I don't want you to answer that now because I know you've got a lot more to cover. Let's come back to that. Okay, sure. And so just, you know, before we get into how to have the conversation, I think one of the key things is, is having an awareness of what the conversation is, is rooted in in a lot of ways. So privilege is definitely a word that we're, we're hearing a lot more of. And just understanding privilege and uh, in a lot of ways, a lot of us have privilege in some areas, right? So it's based on the, the group that you're, you're in and um, everyone with the way that society is constructed, we have a social tag um, that, you know, if I walk into a room as a black woman, there's social tags that come with what it means to be a black woman in America. And so I'm either having to work away from those, you know, stereotypes or, you know, just try to do away with them, but they do affect our experiences in, in, in life. Um, you know, for men, it could be men are seen as leaders, right? So it may be harder for a woman to get a leadership role based on unconscious bias that comes with the social tags and um, you know, realities that come with the privileges that we have. So always say understand privileges and the way that they work. Um, my, the way that I like to describe them in a very easy way is privileges either, depending on what group we belong to, they either, uh, affirm our existence and our, affirm who we are as we sh when we show up or so that would be the exclamation mark or there's a question mark that comes with where we are and how we belong in in you know the organization or in society in general and for organizations it's important that when you're mapping out and you're looking at experiences and you're checking for biases in your process that you're looking for those question marks that could come with, how do we develop our, our people? How do we succession plan? How do we hire? Are we, are we looking at HBCUs as a place to source talent? Or is there a question mark behind HBCUs because they're seen as inferior to you know, an Ivy League school? So those are some of the, the things that you know, I use to just clearly help us understand how privilege works. Um, another example would be 
if you're a left-handed person, right, and you're going through society, there's a lot of things that you have to change, like the scissors that you use, maybe cup holders, depending on the design of the car. There's just a lot of ways that you have to adapt to the standard, right, which would be being right-handed. As a right-handed person, I don't have to think about, you know, where my cup holder is or what kind of scissors I purchase. Um, that's, that's the equivalent of the privileged and groups that are target or marginalized groups. And it's important for us to understand how our privilege works um, and, and so that we can have authentic conversations. Because if we're coming to conversations without understanding or some level of understanding, it could be tough to have conversations that lead to solutions. Well, and that is exactly what I'm seeing um, when I talk to certain, for example, members of my family who, who will adamantly say, we don't have privilege. I've worked for everything I've ever done in my yeah. life. Um, and, and they're, you know, I've, I'm reading Robin um, D'Angelo's book, White Fragility, for this yeah. very reason to understand, you know, what is it I don't understand? Mm -hmm. And so my, my question is, how do, how do you create a safe place when there's polarization in the very concept around uh, the affirmation uh, versus the question, the privilege versus the, that I, I'm still working for everything I get. What are you talking about? How, where do you go from that, you know, instantaneous opposition? Yeah. So I think that's, that's definitely where continued learning workshops, helping people work through understanding what privilege is. It's not negating from the fact that someone, you know, worked to get what they, they have in the moment, but it's saying that again, there are, there's a way that society is set up where your social tag may say that you're a leader. So it's easier for someone to accept that if they're working with unconscious bias than someone who's looked at as maybe the only thing you can do is, you know, you're a janitor, right? That's the social tag that you had. So it's, it's really just understanding that our society is set up in a way that gives advantages to others over other groups and just just accepting that um, and then working through that because it it happens in in many ways as a heterosexual woman I know that I don't have to um, you know I could have a picture or image of my spouse and not think twice about it you know and that may not be the case for someone in the LGBTQ community where in the workspace, depending on the environment that they're in and, and if they feel that they're fully accepted. And it's just those sorts of things that we have to be more mindful and conscious of. And what I'm really, what I'm hearing is that these, I don't want to, to trivialize them. Yeah. The, the one slice of, of privilege that you just uh, explained is a perfect example. Yes, I can have a picture of my spouse, never think twice about it. And if I were in the LGBTQ community, I would, I would have to put my picture away or if, if I was even ever considered because I don't want to be marginalized or um, have biases perpetrated. Exactly. Exactly. Um, one of the things that I read recently that explains um, what you're sharing is the, an example of the voter registration laws that require driver's license to vote. Um, and yet in many states, they have made driver li driver's license offices hundreds of miles away from individuals. And that, that in particular disproportionately impacts black voters and prevents them from being able to vote. And that there is an argument um, that this was intentional and mm -hmm. that, that it was set up intentionally to marginalize low income and black voters. And so part of what I'm, what in this dialogue of what is privilege, what is not is, uh, and this is, a, this is a question and a statement, is opening my eyes to where are the, the small and the large slights that add up yes. to 
significant advantages for some over others. Right. Exactly. That's very helpful. Yep. That was a great example. And so I recently found this, and this is one that has been trending, but it's what does it take to become an anti-racist? And um, one of the, the greatest things that we could know about racism and anti-racism is that none of us were born either or, right? You weren't born racist, you weren't born anti-racist. So it is a absolute choice to make. And um, we've seen this comfort zone um, for, you know, how to move forward with COVID-19 and how to move forward with all the changes there, but the same applies. You have the fear zone, the learning zone, and the growth zone. So some of the traits within the fear zone, right, are just denying that racism is a problem. Um, that within itself is a privilege to be able to say something is not a problem because you have not experienced it. Um, you know, avoiding hard questions and, and really the need to be comfortable all those things are a part of the fear zone. And uh, when you get to the learning zone, it's, it's recognizing that there is a problem, doing the work, uh, learning about racism, asking people for their experiences, uh, educating yourself. And the key here is just the vulnerability. So Anissa, when you and I first had the conversation, um, you know, you shared things with me and I won't share, share that here, but you know, <laughs> unless you, that's one of the things is establishing norms and, and yeah. when things are confidential. But you and I had a conversation that was very vulnerable. We, we both shared our stories and that is the human aspect of th these conversations. At that point, my guard is down. I believe your guard is down and we could really have an authentic conversation from there to try to work out solutions. We're both really intelligent people, I think, and so not so being able to just talk, right, and, and putting the human behind it, um, because like we said, no one is born racist. We're, we're not, privilege is not something that's earned, right? And just like being marginalized is not earned, but the reality is it's something that is associated with us based on social constructs. So we have to understand that there may be experiences that you had or that I had that really add to this and how are we affected by, you know, inequality and, and, and racism in there. Uh, this model is really, I hadn't seen it yet, and this is really helpful. One of the things that I had shared with Candace that I'll share with everyone, um, uh, I was raised in a racist family. My father was a racist and um, I love my father, um, but it's very hard to talk about where I came from that influenced me in my earlier life and who I am now. And it's also very uncomfortable to know that I have lived my entire life, my entire adult life wanting to be the best version of me. Um, and growth and emotional intelligence in an, in an unbiased way and still knowing that there's so many things I don't understand and so many ways in which my biases impact my relationship and my ability to, to, to make a difference and um, being accepted in that conversation with you in spite of my history and my past. It just made it easier for me to say, and I can do more because yeah. I felt that love and acceptance from you. Yep. That's, that's great. And, you know, and from my perspective, that conversation was powerful because it was, it was real, right? It was true. There wasn't like this pink elephant in the room that we were trying to get away from. You were sharing your story, your experience and how it impacted you. And that, that's it's so powerful, right? And, um, for me, it's, you know, being able to, you know, looking at that growth zone portion that we're looking at now, it's being able to sit in our discomfort and how that really does break barriers um, that, you know, and it, it really creates an atmosphere where change can happen. So um, 
I thank you for that because that was a yeah. we had a great conversation. Oh, Sarah, really quickly. So the <laughs> you know the reason that we're here is to really talk about how to have those conversations, and again that first piece on on starting with love, but also understanding that this affects us all, right? So there's a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King that just says, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, right? We're, we're caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny and whatever affects, affects one directly affects us all indirectly. So understanding that while, you know, the issue may affect some directly and, and you may have to you know, learn or figure out what's happening and understand experiences, it still affects, affects us all. Um, and taking, on it, taking it on from that piece, I think, um, helps with managing the burden of it all <laughs> because um, it's, all, it's work that we all have to do as individuals and then collectively we come together to, to, to solve a lot of these challenges, um, depending on what inequality we're talking about. Uh, again, do the work to understand. So Anissa, another part of that conversation we had, you were sharing, you know, I'm reading this and this is what I've learned. And that's helpful for having that discussion because you're, you're not putting all the weight on, you know, me to share, you know, this is my experience, let me teach X, Y, and Z. You know, you're bringing things to the conversation and, you know, I would want to do the same on, on if the, the table were flipped on another side of um, an inequality or a discussion around this that, you know, let me, let me do the work to understand, to reflect on my own life. Let me go to childhood. When was the first time I noticed differences? Uh, who me about differences? What did they say? Because believe it or not, that information, that data that we were given, it does still guide us if it goes unchecked. So it's just important to really go back and be honest and, and look back and, and look to date at our history and what we've done and the actions that we've taken. And even in conversations like this, check your temperature, check your pulse. How are you feeling? And really unpack that to learn more because the more that you know, the more that you're aware, um, we're able to, to grow from there. Um, again, we said share your story, share your experiences. And that, that's the, the vulnerability piece. I always um, encourage people when you're having these conversations, speak from your own experience. Speak from your experience. What happened? How did that make you feel? How are you impacted? Um, because oftentimes we wanna try to bring in asking for a friend, saying this for a friend to try to take out the discomfort. But when we share our own stories, that's where the vulnerability happens. That's where the transparency happens. That's where connection happens. Um, and then understanding intent versus impact. So this is a big one because I think a lot of times we have good intentions or we could have good intentions, but it may land differently yes. on someone else based on their experiences. And we have to be okay when that person tells us, when you said X, Y, and Z, this is what it made me feel like. Or when you did X, Y, and Z, this is the message it communicated to me. And being okay with unpacking that, sitting in the discomfort, mistakes are not the end of the world as long as you keep going, right? And, um, you know, an, an example that I like to give is, you know, if someone stepped on my toe, they did it and they said, I'm sorry. And uh, I said, okay, that's fine, right? And then maybe they did it a second time. I would say, okay, <laughs> maybe watch where you're going. And then the third time, it doesn't feel too much like an accident, right? It feels intentional. So their intention may have not been to step on my toe, but my toe still hurts. So let's deal with that reality instead of you know the sole focus on what the intention was. But at the same time, um, at the organizational level, uh, there is the concept we have to assume positive intent, right? So if someone does say something that was off, in order to meet vulnerability with, um, you know, uh, 
the energy that's going to bring about change, we do have to assume positive intent for the purpose of working towards better, right? Giving feedback, sharing how, not just kind of sort of going into, um, you know, well, this is how they're going to be, this is how they are, but share feedback, assume that they want to change if they've, if they've expressed that. Um, and, and that's how we really grow as an organization in, in having these conversations. Yep. And then the last piece is just a commitment to doing the work to inequality. Um, again, that's doing the work at the individual level. When you see, um, you see inequality, you pointing, point it out, track it, notice what's happening in the organization, um, being able to uh, step up and step back when necessary so that other voices can be amplified. If you, you're noticing, you know, you're in a meeting and there's only a certain amount of people talking, um, being able to speak up and allow other voices to be heard during that time or step back rather is an example. That is something that um, I'm writing a lot as I'm journaling my lessons is where and how am I silent or am I quiet where is in, in, in most situations of injustice, I'm super vocal. So are there areas in which I am sitting back and allowing others to hold, carry the full burden? Yeah. Um, and, and this piece right here about doing the necessary work to end, end inequality. Mm -hmm. You know, this brings up a really good question. Um, John wrote, so if we have vo voter fraud, which there are numerous examples of it happening around the country, what is your solution to ensure that we are able to confirm one's residence and legal right to vote while preventing voter fraud? We can't just say, come vote without identification. And, and so that, of course, you know, if this were a dialogue in an organization, that's going to come up when someone yeah. uses the example like I use, the opposite is going to come up. How do we have a healthy conversation around the, the two different perspectives? Yeah, so I think, you know, his question is valid. How do you identify? So I would say maybe it's not a matter of the, the um, validating identity, but a matter of, you said that the, the, um, the voter driver's registration, the, the ability to miles get and miles the away. driver's so license. That's something. a resource issue, right? That's so a resource issue. It, can that, should there be something in place where people within a certain radius are able to get there and it's accessible? So that's, that's right. an accessibility issue versus the actual issue about validating identity. Well, if we go to your last statement here, commit to doing the necessary work to end any inequality, and we recognize that there is an inequality issue, like the ability to have proper identification to be able to vote and the accessibility of that, um, then if we're really committed to um, equality, then mm -hmm. that means more of us who are not impacted by that need to have a vocal voice in, exactly. there's a disparity here. Yeah. And let, let's work to solve that disparity. Yep, precisely. Because it, it is, and it's not, and I think a lot, a lot of times the conversation is more around, um, you know, this, it makes sense to want to verify identity. Absolutely. But it, it doesn't make sense that someone would have to go 300 miles or whatever number you gave. Yep. So that's the, that would be the issue to tackle, not necessarily how or the rule around it. That's right. Mm -hmm. that's right. Um, and one of the things that we are, you know, as I'm educating myself, I'm learning is that <clears throat> with privilege, those kinds of situations get resolved differently yeah. than without privilege. There's, there's no one to listen to change, to advocate, to resolve the inequality. So it remains um, a problem. Yeah, it, it's, it's a different process. You know, exactly. um, social economic status is another way, right? If you're in a middle class, upper middle class area, you may have access to things that others just do not have. And um, how, you know, someone would go and, and organize around what they need in their community 
what look, may look different in those communities. So it's just right. understanding, understanding that and, and being sensitive to those experiences. So Paige has a good question. She says, some of my relatives very much have that mindset of I haven't personally experienced it and therefore it doesn't exist. Um, it's really difficult to pull them into a conversation about racism when they just deny it exists. How would you suggest approaching these sorts of people with conversations like this that they may, that may reject outside perspectives? Is there a point where we should just give up on certain people who may just be too set in their ways? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, that's a great conversation. Um, that's a great question. I would say you continue to do the work if you see it. Um, you continue to do the work. I don't know um, how to, I think this is a journey that people have to want to be on um, and people have to want to get out of their comfort zone. I don't know how to get people not to, <laughs> you know, see, see things differently other than, you know, where you can and where you feel like you can make a difference um, with the members in your 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 household or your family or in your network, try to do that, right? And where you can't, um, I would just say, continue to just lead by example where you, where you can. You know, this is, it's not the same, but um, I, you know, with, with all learning, we all attempt to make correlations and that's how we learn. We learn from the symbols and the correlations in our mind and in our experiences in order to come to our new perspectives. And I remember a time when it was acceptable for a man in the workplace to call a woman honey. Honey. And it's now, the word is pejorative, right? It's, yeah. it's not acceptable. And there had to be a time when progressive women had to stand up and say, please don't call me honey. I find it demeaning and inappropriate. And those first women who did that were considered you know, bitches and critical and bulldogs and dykes. And, you know, you don't want me to call you honey? No problem. I got other names for you. Right? Yeah. It was a difficult process to move away from that condes the, the condescension. Right. The challenge is the intent behind the word honey wasn't all pejorative. Not everyone that called a woman honey meant it as a slam or as a condescension. Right. Mm -hmm. But the impact, which is where we come to this intent versus impact. Can you share with me, and this is something that I've done for years now, you know, in conversations about racism. My best friend that I travel the world with is black. Um, my daughter, her boyfriend is black. Um, yeah. I have a, a, a black niece, uh, sorry, nephew, and um, my, my son's best friend lived on our couch his entire, you know, so those are examples of me not being a racist, right? And I'm not the only white person that brings that to bear in a conversation about racism. And yet my understanding is that doesn't mean I inherently understand all the biases. Right. How does that land for you when someone says, I'm not racist, I got a black friend? Yeah, that's a great one. Um, you know, when I hear that, it, those are great. That's great. But I, again, I don't think that it, it's actually addressing the concern at hand. So if someone says, because when we go back to what it means to be anti-racist, it means being okay with being uncomfortable, right? And, and you know, approaching and talking about these topics um, and oftentimes when that's done, it's almost a derailer from something that happened that was offensive. So maybe, um, yeah, so maybe someone said something that maybe it was a microaggression and maybe they were approached on it where in that example that you gave about honey, where the intent is not bad, but if someone says, hey, you just caught me honey, and I feel like that was belittling as a woman. And they say, I'm not belittling women. I have a wife who I've been with for 20 plus years, and right. I have a daughter. And I, I and love like, women. Yeah, it's like, I, I get that. That's great. And I believe you, but that's not taking away from the impact that was yeah. just, <laughs> you know, from what I'm saying at this moment. And there's there are ways to be all of those things, but still carry some biases. 
right? Yes. And it's just understanding that this is a journey that we all have to continue to uncover, learn, and grow from understanding and, and learning from the experiences of others. Does that so answer your question? It, 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 it does. And it's easy talking with you. <laughs> you and I have done the work. You know, you can tell me anything and I'm going to be like, oh my God, I didn't mean to be so such an idiot, right? And I'm going to go back and I'm going to do more work. And so we've done our EQ work and our self work. Right. What do we do when the fight and the anger and the passion or whatever you want to call it is so staunch on both sides and it just, you just clash like symbols, mm -hmm. unable to move away from the impact, even, you know, in this situation, if, even if, if the intent is good, but the impact is poor. Yeah. How, do, how, how, let's just, what I want to say, how do white people handle it when I want to be kind and loving and I am met with anger, mm -hmm. even though it, I didn't do it, I am still part of a system that has done it. What, what do I do with that to not get tied into that emotion? Yeah. I would say at that point, you know, it's important to, to be transparent and authentic about how you're feeling in, in that moment. Um, if you're, you're met with anger, um, but understanding that the discomfort that you may feel, um, when it comes to anger, I, I just, you know, for me, it's, it's a tough one because for me, I, I try to understand every, the story, right? I, I grew up with everyone has a story, so you need to learn their story. Um, and so for me, it's how can I help you or how can I help in the situation? What is it that I can do? Um, and for me, I would think that being transparent and being authentic about, listen, this is what I want to achieve and this is what I've done and this is what I'm doing. How can I, what can I do, you know, or here's what, this is what I'm doing. What do you think about this? And just taking more of an, an ally approach, um, a partnership versus, you know, if met with anger, you know, try to diffuse the situation. I think if, as HR professionals, especially, if we have employees that are, um, you know, passionate about a subject or a topic, and we truly want to help them, we have systems and we have the EQ in place to, to sort of diffuse the situation and try to start focusing on the solutions. Mm -hmm. And here's what we're doing here's, you know, what do you think about this sort of thing, but making it a dialogue and getting back to dialogue and getting back to, you know, that vulnerable vulnerability mm -hmm. within a conversation. You know, we, we, we talked before about verbal Aikido and everyone, especially when we're passionate about something, uh, uh, we want to feel heard. We want our opinion to be validated. Yeah. If we're passionate about it, we are committed to that opinion, at least in that moment on, on some level. And what I, I hear you saying is, is the, the, the meeting uh, passion or anger with anger does nothing but cause a clash. Yeah. Whereas, but, yeah. yeah. But ahead. I think you, you, you hit it on the nail. It's the acknowledgement, right? So if someone is passionate or angry or whatever the case may be, um, understanding that there may be something that they feel like is not being heard. And yes. even just saying, I hear you. This yes. is what I've learned. Yes. I mean, that, that could let the guard down, you know, help a person uh, just really diffuse the situation and then share, you know, or build towards how can we work together? What can I do? Or what can you know, here's so what I'm doing. Even when it's a polarized opinion, starting with, I hear you, I see you, I, I, I may not be able to understand fully the shoes you've walked in, mm -hmm. but I, I get that this is important to you. Yeah. And it's okay to have differences of opinions. I think where people 
look at diversity and inclusion is that it totally creates a one-sided sort of approach. But it's okay to say, if I say something, it's okay for you to say, here's what I hear you, this is what you're saying, but here's what I think about it. And here's what this yeah. makes me feel. That's a dialogue, that's a conversation. And it's okay for that to, to be um, had, right? Those conversations to happen. Well, this piece, uh, would you go back to that model you had earlier, but this Absolutely. piece about reflect, unlearn, relearn and empathize is a, it is a really important process. Most of us yeah. don't realize we, it, we must unlearn yeah. <laughs> if we are to create um, a fair, equitable society. Yeah. One I think, free of racism. Yeah. I think for me, what, what I've learned over the last few weeks is that there's a quote that says, you know, the litter of the 21st century, not those who can't read or write, but those who can't learn, unlearn and relearn. Mm, yes. And for me, it's, there's so much that I don't know. And there's so much with, e even for me, that I, I've taken the position of comfort and sort of turned a blind eye to things that happen around the world and in our society um, from a place of comfort. So it's important for me to go into conversations and go into dialogues, understanding that I don't have all the answers, understanding that I don't know what I don't know, and understanding that my experience is something that needs to be shared. And I also need to hear it from the experiences of others. But what's most important out of all of this is you know, the actions that we take on a daily basis to make it, make the world better, make our organizations better. And that's where this growth zone comes in. These are many, these are actions. Yeah. You know, I yield positions of power to those otherwise marginalized. I surround myself with others who think and, and look differently than me. I educate my peers how racism harms our profession. I speak out when I see racism in action. Yeah. I sit with my discomfort. I promote and advocate for policies and leaders that are anti-racist. I identify how I may unknowingly benefit from with racism. I said that one last on purpose because I think that that's a really, that's a, it's a difficult one for pr privileged to really wrap our minds around. What do yeah. you mean I've benefited? I hate it. I don't like it. I, I do speak out about it. How exactly am I benefiting? Now, I, I personally get it, but I think it's a dialogue that's really tough. Yeah. How do we have that dialogue? Yeah. So why do you think that dialogue is, is so tough? Well, personally, because I'm also a, a coach, I know that there's a secondary gain yeah. to me benefiting from not wanting racism, right, to go away. If I get a, you know, four-step head start and I get to win the prize because of that, then there are people in society who would rather just let me keep my advantage and I'm going to fight for that advantage. Mm -hmm. And in some of the, I just watched um, the 13th Amendment, um, mm. on Netflix. Yeah. And there's a scene that I just, I just shuddered when I was watching it. It was a scene of the, of the Ku Klux Klan and the grand poobah guy talking about how it, if we integrate, it will ruin both races. And, and it was really what he was really saying is I don't want to lose my edge. I don't want to lose my whiteness. I don't want to lose my privilege. So I have to fight for that privilege. And, and I think that that's a, 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 a difficult thing for many people to shed. Sure, I'll give up my critical advantage. You bet. You know, that's a, that's a tough conversation. Yeah. So that, that was very transparent. And <laughs> I think when we're, we're talking about it, because it's, it's easier for me to say, you know, I, I can recognize the privileges I have in certain groups, in certain areas, you know, being able bodied, right. And being able to, you know, just walk out and not really think about, you know, accommodations and things like that. Like I could, I can see that and it's okay. It's not hard for me to accept that, but I get that, um, 
it's a tougher conversation because again, going back to that fear or love, um, and, and the reality is we're, we're all affected and it's, it's something that's not working for, for all of us. Right. Um, and, and the reality is that getting out of that fear zone and getting out of the scarcity, right. Or there's not enough for all of us to be great. Right. And feeling like there needs to be, or not wanting to acknowledge that there are things in our society and in place like that voter registration piece that you talked about, why wouldn't there be one in proximity to a, another community, right? right. There, there are things like that that we really have to look at. That's not an exclamation mark, that's a question mark in it's our society. And um, we have to be, we have to acknowledge it. So maybe, you know, just if you want to look at it that way, it's, it's a question mark. You know, I love it. I love where you went from getting out of the fear zone into the learning zone, into the growth zone. And, and it reminds me of just that, this, this hierarchy of values that I mm -hmm. aim to live by. Okay. And, and it's only at times when I recognize I'm living by a lower value, uh, a lower value of fear of loss, fear of missing out, whatever it is. And then recognizing, no, my higher value is to be a part of, the the generations that end racism that's my yeah. higher value mm -hmm. and if i have to and i use i because i'm i'm really talking about us as a as a, a you know in black and white terms kind of okay. you know as a group but i think that it's going to be important for us to have that conversation around am i willing to give up that privilege in order to see the end of racism for me personally the answer is yes um and who who can really see the future as to what that really means yeah. And, um, and part of this dialogue will have to be a dialogue around it's, it's not going, the boomerang isn't going to come around and suddenly we are enslaved, uh, you know, or whatever those fears might be. Mm -hmm. um, and nobody has that crystal ball. What do we do if we're in an organization, we're having this conversation and it gets heated, how can HR push pause or facilitate healthy dialogue that goes somewhere? Yeah. First, I would equip um, all conversations with establishing some sort of norms and some ground rules. Uh, I, I highly recommend that if you have these conversations that you do have someone who's a skilled facilitator around these sorts of dialogues, one. Um, and then this, the next piece would be before opening up and having these discussions, you have some sort of norms that are established. So um, like you shared your story with me, I didn't want to share that until I had permission from you to share that. And that's for a reason because it is a, it is a piece where we have to be able to build our bank accounts of trust and we have to be able to build trust and not necessarily, oh, Anissa told me this, so let me go tell five other people that. So establishing those sort of rules within the organization as you're preparing to have these discussions is really important. And then uh, another piece is that if it does get heated, that's okay, but yeah. know when it's time to take a break and pause. Um, I've been in organizations where we've done this and, and you know people were in tears and people were crying at the realities of things that they didn't know or things that they had to bring back up. And it's okay to be human and to, to pause in those moments but that those same organizations are organizations that are doing leaps and bounds in terms of the work and um, really good cultures that they've been able to create out of, out of that transparency in those moments of vulnerability. That's such a, that's such a really good point. Um, we've got time for one more question. Okay. Um, do you have advice on how to move as a person and as an organization from the learning, learning zone to the growth zone? Yeah, that's, that's great. I love that question. <laughs> so, and that's very, very important because I think oftentimes organizations do get stuck in that, that cycle of, you know, we're just doing a workshop, we're just learning and we're talking and we're talking and we're doing more talking. Um, but a great way to do that is to really look at your structures, look at your organization, your practices, 
you know, your, how you're hiring people to how you're developing people and so forth and so on. And just all the decision points within your company, making sure that you have a lens that's anti-racist and making sure that you eliminate biases out of your organization. Um, and there's, there's a lot of, you know, individuals and consultants or coaches that could help with that. And certainly a lot of literature and resources that are, that are out there, but understanding that you may have some places where there's question marks and people are not getting, you know, the covenant shoulder tap to be developed. So you're missing out on opportunities to develop, de develop people into leadership positions, for example. Yeah. Well, and, and something that you said earlier too, um, And, and, and I'm not, I'm going to butcher it. So I'm going to try, I, I'm going to try to rephrase it. So something you said earlier about being willing to, to move through the zones, knowing that there is no, there's no, we're not born <laughs> in the growth zone. Right. Um, all of us have our biases and, mm -hmm. and, and it is a process. That was where you, what you said, this is a process. Yes. It's a journey. It's a journey. It's a, a journey. Mm -hmm. um, so the formula from here, you know, if, an, if someone on the call is going to take back a solution to their organization, what are the top one or two or three things that they can start with right away? Yeah, I would say if they have not already, uh, make, a, make a stance. Like it, from the top down, it, there should be a clear um, stance on where the organization is as it relates to diversity, inclusion, and equity within the organization. Um, that's first and foremost. The second piece is definitely uh, looking at your structure, looking at how your organization makes decisions, uh, looking at your data to see if there's any areas where there are some, some biases happening and address, address those. Um, and then I would say definitely opening it up if you've not done a workshop or if you have not had employees share their experiences around diversity and inclusion within your organization, that's information that you need. And you certainly need to be able to equip your employees with the tools and the resources to create and weave in inclusion in your culture. Very good, very good. So someone asked whether or not we're gonna share the slides and we are. Um, okay. It'll be on the Leading in a Crisis um, Hay Summit portal. Um, we will also be sharing uh, this talk as well as the other talks on our SoundWise channel, which is uh, our, our podcasting uh, set and it's called Leading in a Crisis there. I'm gonna show my screen again and show folks how they can uh, reach Candace. Candace, um, share with us the, when people reach out to you and hire you as a, as a, a talent strategist and consultant, what are the, the kinds of work that you do with organizations? Oh boy, everything related to workforce <laughs> <laughs> development. So yeah, I'm, I'm that, anything related to talent management. Of course, I do a lot of work with diversity and inclusion and helping organizations um, better in terms of equity and inclusion with um, their workforce. And yeah, just anything related to strategy, how you hire, how you recruit, uh, source, develop, you name it. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Excellent. My screen keeps going. Okay, there we go. So yes, folks, thank you so much for joining us. If you have found this conversation um, helpful, do let us know. Let us know. We have uh, a few more um, leading in a crisis relevant to our pandemic as well as uh, relevant to the Black Lives matter movement um, and what that means for us as organizational consultants as well as um, HR folks in uh, organizations. So reach out if we may support you. Um, once again, we are starting the anti-racism facilitated dialogue circles inside uh, organizations to facilitate this very dialogue. Um, we do customize it with or an organization's policies and format. So there are um, some compliance issues, there are some concerns that our HR partners may have, we work closely with you to make sure that we deal with those in a way that is comfortable and still as progressive as your organization will allow those dialogues to become. Um, we can be reached at 281-469-4244. So 
Candace, as always, it is a, a pleasure to have you with us. And I really appreciate you sharing just your soul and your expertise. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us. Take care.